Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak through my words. And as we look into um, this letter, that we would hear your word clearly. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we, um, we're being videoed, uh, recorded, and we're also on Facebook apparently live streaming, and there's all this technology going on. Um, so that means uh, I have to watch what I say. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and also, I don't know, if, has anyone seen the sermon videos that have been online? Jerry's been filming them. Anyone else seen them? Um, I watched it back, and um, I was so disappointed with how my hair looked on the video um, <laughs> that I went down to Rami's and I said, I need a haircut, and it needs to go up a bit more at the side, because every time I, I was doing this, and I just was getting annoyed at myself. Um, so uh, um, let's get that out of the way now. So if you don't like the haircut, then um, just... <laughs> on a yellow card, and I will um, I'll go back to Rami's and get it fixed for next week. But to serious matters, we're on uh, the fourth week now, I think, of, um, of our walk through 1 Corinthians, and the reading Stephen read um, covered some fairly broad areas, um, so I'm going to kind of narrow them down to two, and I'm going to take a walk through the text. It's on page 1772, um, and uh, my top tip for you if you like to follow along um, with the Bible in church is to, uh, when you get to church, assuming you're here um, in time to do this, um, is to take your prayer bookmark and put it in the page. Okay, then when it's time, you just need to open it. Um, That's clever, isn't it? Um, Or you can do it with your bulletin, it works the same. Uh, But that will save you having to look for the page at the last moment. And then the person's reading and you're thinking, where are we? So, um, So do it at the start. This is a passage that addresses really two things. We talk, we hear first about people and then we hear about buildings. Not kind of the buildings we might think of when we think of buildings, so I'm going to get to that. But firstly, what about people? Now, um, many people here have been in the church longer than a year. And so you might hear this first four verses of 1 Corinthians 3 and think, he's being a bit harsh, isn't he? Paul is talking to them as though they're babies, talking about infant food, like he's spoon-feeding them. Uh, That's his kind of, the illusion that he's making. The point that Paul is trying to make is, when I was with you, uh, you were a really new church. You were like an infant. And so I gave you what you needed to begin with. Um, I gave you milk first to not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. So it was kind of saying, this is is the introduction. Um, He says you are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? They're still like it. They're still behaving in the way they were at the beginning. And he's almost saying it was okay. It was okay when the church started. Um, It was okay. Because you were humans, living as humans, trying to work out what it means to live as the church. Now he's saying, look, this is still going on. Now's the time for you to kind of grow up as a church. When one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? Do you ever do that thing when you talk about yourself in the third person? You know, David would really like a cup of coffee today. That wasn't a question, I've I've had two. Um, as you might tell by my running around. Um, but you know that people say that, well, so-and-so is feeling sad today, and they're talking about themselves. Well, that's kind of what Paul's doing here. He's almost stepping outside himself, and he's saying, what after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Well, they were both leaders in the church, um, but particular kinds of leaders. He says the next word, only servants. Paul and Apollos were servants. So effectively, what you've, going, what you've got going on here, and you can imagine this, in a church today, or some other organization, but we're talking about the church. You can imagine there are two leaders in the church. One who kind of got the church going, and another one who came along a bit later. And so the people who were there are saying, well, when so-and-so was the rector, it used to be like this. That's never happened in any churches any of us have been in, has it? And people wonder whether 1 Corinthians is relevant today. I think it is. I think it is. In our human nature, we like to go back to a certain person or another person. And there are, we, we can end up forming these groups. And what Paul is saying is, look, that is not the way it should be. 
Because whether you follow Paul or whether you follow Apollos, we're both following God. We're both doing the same thing. And he actually says of himself and Apollos, we're the, we're the kind of the lowest of the low. The word servant that's used here in the Greek is, is the word for deacon that we use. And deacon means originally table waiter. So effectively they're saying, we're, we're like the table waiters. We're bringing water to you when you've run out. Um, that's, that's what we are. We're just servants. Don't put us on such a pedestal that you might say, well, we're going to follow this person or this person. We're just the servants. We're here as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, and God has been making it grow. This is a reminder to us as human beings to remember that we are going to bring our human minds into the way we see each other in the church. Paul is saying, I planted the seed. I got the church going. Apollos came along and watered it. it, it we're, not, we're not doing different things. We were doing different parts on the same journey. Not long after I was here, um, we had the bishop come and she confirmed and reaffirmed 19 people. If you were Pentecostals, you'd all say amen now. Amen. But because you're Angl Anglicans, you're going, did she? Was I there? I don't remember that one. Oh, yes, I do. I had to bake some squares. Um, I've told you my story about squares, haven't I? Okay. <laughs> Those who haven't heard it, I can't tell it now. I'll tell you later. Um, the, the short version is I worked out that I can't cut squares. And mine ended up being rectangles. Um, so there we are. And now I've lost my train of thought completely. So. Sorry? Platform seven. Train. Yeah, now you're, now you're all through. <laughs> okay. So the bishop <laughs> came to St. George's and confirmed and reaffirmed 19 people. And um, all I did, all I did was I said, Bishop, would you come and do it? And she said, yes, I will. And then I asked, coerced, nagged, Badgered, but I asked many people, have you been confirmed? Are you confirmed? Would you like to be confirmed? I, I was a tiny, tiny, tiny part in the journey, a journey that had been begun one or two priests or rectors ago. So this passage reminds us that we're part of the continuum. When we look at the, the forests around us and the... Um, and, and maybe better to look at gardens that are kind of cultured. And you see over the years, different people have looked after the garden. And so we're part of a continuous whole. And what Paul is saying is it's not about one person. That we didn't get 19 confirmations because I did all the work. We got 19 confirmations that first year through a number of factors. And my tiny piece of the jigsaw was I just asked. But the seeds had been planted long ago. The seeds had been watered by many people be they priests or deacons or people in um, family members, people who were sitting next to them in the pews. Paul says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. And the reality is what happens in church is God makes us grow, which is great because it means I can relax. It's not my job. Your salvation is not my problem. Your salvation is between you and God. My job is to come alongside you and talk about it, to encourage. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, it says in verse 8. So the message from Paul is clear. Don't get into these factions. Don't get going, well, this person or this person or this person, focus on God. And he says, okay, I've done talking with people. I'm going to talk about buildings. People like buildings. We can understand buildings when we talk about, some people like talking about people and feelings, but I think most of us find it more easy to talk about buildings because we can see them, we can touch them, we can understand what they are. And so we start talking about buildings in verse 10. And he says, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. And someone else is building on it. 
Each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. The cornerstone of this building was laid, I want to say it was 1989 by Douglas Hambridge, um, and uh, nobody's shouting at me, so either you don't know or that's correct. Um, but there's a, there, there was a big event, and, and there, was, um, there was a shovel that was used. Um, We've borrowed the shovel, I think it's in my garden right now, but the shovel exists still that, that Doug um, and, uh, and, the, and the cornerstone of the building was laid. The cornerstone is the foundation stone on which the church is built. And we sung this morning of Christ alone being our cornerstone. Christ is our foundation. As a church, it's very easy to get busy doing things, isn't it? It's very easy to get really busy doing things and we can run off in different directions saying, we need to do this and we need to do this and we need to do that. And we can focus on that level of what do we need to be doing? When we stop and ask the question, uh, why are we doing it? We get to the next level, which is, well, where do we want to be? What kind of a church do we want to be in five years' time, in ten years' time? The building exists here because many people, many of you still here, had a vision and said, we want to build a bigger church so that more people can come. We want to make it flat so that whether people are coming with a stroller and a baby or in a wheelchair, that they feel as welcome as everyone else. That was the vision um, that, that precipitated the building of this particular church building here um, and the move from the old one. And so that's kind of the where question. But the real question that we always need to come back to as a church is why? Why are we here? Why are we here at all? What is our foundation? What is our cornerstone? Because you can find all sorts of reasons for doing those other things, but it comes down to what do we believe at the end of the day? What do we believe? And we said as part of our vision process, and this is a recap for some and for others the first time you were hearing it, we said there are two Bible verses which kind of uh, form our foundation. One of them is on the stained glass window um, at the chapel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to the end that whoever believes in him would not perish but would have eternal life. So we believe in eternal life. Amen? Amen. Don't get too excited. Uh, we believe in eternal life. Amen. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, it, it helps. I, get more, I, can, I can do more when you, when you respond. Uh, we believe in eternal life, but we kind of said that's not enough. Because if we believe in eternal life, um, well, what are we doing now? Do we need to come to church? Do we need to grow in faith? Because if we basically believe that we're all going to heaven, that's fine, isn't it? And we said, no, but, but, but this eternal life is not just for one day in heaven. This eternal life is for now. John 10 Chapter 10 says, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life, and life in all its fullness. Or other translations say, abundant life. Again, uh, if you like gardening, that picture of you know, the, the flowers that are blooming wonderfully. Abundant life, life in all its fullness now. And so we believe as a church in life in all its fullness now that Jesus gives us. We can experience the kingdom of heaven now. We sung about the kingdom coming and we're, we, we shared the peace as a way of being people of peace and bringing that kingdom in. We do it when the children are in the room and, and just before they go out because we believe that children should learn to share the peace. And that's part of how we, we develop um, as a whole church community. And we teach people to say, let's share hands of peace instead of fighting. So we share the peace with each other for a reason. It's because we want to be people who are bringing in the kingdom and that starts with us. That starts with us here. So we're about life in all its fullness now and eternal life with Jesus. That's the, the two parts of the picture. That's why we're here. And so everything that we do, be it the baby cafe or serving at the community supper, um, thank you for those who went last night and did that. Um, thank you for those who help at the baby cafe. Whether it's the fall fair that's coming up in uh, a few weeks' time, um, which is an opportunity to just invite people into the space to eat pies, to enjoy each other's company, and to raise some money this time for the supper, um, uh, the community supper. So, whatever it is we're doing, that all comes from saying Jesus Christ is our foundation, Jesus is our cornerstone. We do all those things because we want people to know Jesus. 
Not just so they've got an assurance of heaven ahead, but so they can experience life in all its fullness now. That's why we're here. And that's what Paul's saying. Build your lives, build your church on Jesus Christ. There is no other foundation. Some churches try and have other foundations and they tend to go wrong. The only foundation is the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. So we're talking about buildings. And then he comes in verse 16 and 17 to talk about the temple. Um, Who's heard of the temple before? Great, just checking you're awake. Um, The temple um, was the place where you went to go and worship God. If you wanted to worship God in the Old Testament, you went to the temple. Um, The temple in Jerusalem, and, and you would go there, and that's where God was. You would go to the temple, and worship God. And the word that's used here for, for temple, um, there's, there's kind of two ways you can use the word temple uh, from this Greek word and, uh, in the Greek. And this particular one um, means like the real temple. So what do I mean? Um, you might come to church and, uh, in the week and come along and wander up and down the corridor out there and then you see someone later in the day and you say, yes, I was at church today. You were physically in the space that is the church. But today, you're in the church. Not the church, but the chat. Do you know? <laughs> this is the church. <laughs> Not the narthex or the lobby. This is the church. OK. I'm laboring that point. But the temple. There was the temple, as in the kind of the whole site of the temple. The people might say, that's the temple. And then there was the bit where God was. The temple. So, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and the Spirit dwells in your midst? So we began talking about people and then we moved to think about this metaphor of buildings and now Paul is talking about the temple which was a building. But now, in the New Testament, as Christians, we believe that the temple is not a place we need to go to, but the temple is in each of us, that God gave us his Holy Spirit, and it is within us. Don't you yourself know, don't you know that you yourselves, sorry, are God's temple, and the Spirit dwells in your midst? This is the verse that people who are on um, diets say, I'm, I'm not going to eat that because my body's a temple. And this is kind of one of those verses where it comes from. It's nothing to do with that. This is about saying that you don't have to come here. You don't have to come and stand at this rail and to receive communion on a Sunday morning in order to experience God. Because if you're a Christian, if you've been baptized, if you've received the Holy Spirit, then you have the Holy Spirit within you. So the temple in the New Testament moves from a place where we go to a place that God gives within us. The Holy Spirit is inside us. Does that mean that we don't need to come to church to worship God? Does that mean that we don't need to come to church to worship God? No. We come because we want to be built up and encouraged and reminded that we build our church, we build our Christian lives on Jesus Christ as our cornerstone. We come to be refreshed with the Holy Spirit. And you can be filled with the Holy Spirit wherever you go. You can be up the mountain and say, Holy Spirit, would you fill me now? And when you pray that the Holy Spirit will come, the Holy Spirit will come. You don't have to be here. But when we meet together, when we pray that we are filled together, we experience the Spirit move in profound ways. So Paul is saying, the building that we're doing is not so much about physical buildings. It's not so much about building a literal church with a literal cornerstone. It's about building a church with a cornerstone who is Jesus Christ. It's about the temple that is in each one of you. So when you wake up in the morning and you look at yourself in the mirror, you can say to yourself, wow, my body is a temple where the Holy Spirit can dwell. And when you go out tomorrow on the West Coast Express or on Highway 1 and you sit there in traffic, remember, your body is a temple where the Holy Spirit can dwell. And when you go into your office and, uh, you, you, or you're at school in a class and you find yourself in a situation that's difficult or uncomfortable, 
Know that one of God's ambassadors, an ambassador for Christ, has walked into that situation. God has put you in that place, and you can do the work of God in that place because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. I think this is pretty amazing. So Paul, in summary, is um, writing to this church, saying, look, it's time to look beyond people. It's time to stop having your favorite priest or your favorite rector or your favorite deacon. It's time to stop doing those things. It's time to see that God is the one who will make the flowers grow. God is the one who will make the church grow. And so we need, in being, um, to to bring the, the title on the screen to bear, we are called to be saints, people who live out lives for God, holy lives for God. And as part of that, we need to be a church that is united. And that means being united with each other in this place and being united with other churches in our community. I um, am part of, um, we're part of as a church, the Ministerial Association, and there's kind of two of them. There's one with the kind of more mainline traditional denominations. Um, and, um, and then there's, there's another Ministerial Association which is, which is bigger. And I kind of have a foot in both sides. And it's fascinating, um, kind of being in that place. It's quite a hard place to be because there's a real breadth of theology and understanding. But I come at it saying Jesus Christ is our cornerstone. That unity is more important than division. And that as we pray together, we're going to see things happen. And so, one of the things about being Anglican is we hold that difficult space, that difficult space in the middle. And I think part of it um, is, is trying to do what Paul is saying. Trying to take take a step back from this way or that way, from Paul or Apollos, from this style or this style, and seeing that neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Paul finishes chapter 3 by saying, all things are yours, whether Paul or Apostle or Cephas, who was another leader, um, or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. These are all things that they were worried about. But he said what matters, verse 23, you are of Christ. The most important thing that we can hear today, if you forget everything else I've said, know this, you are of Christ. Every single one of us, you are of Christ. And Christ is of God. You are of Christ and Christ is of God. So we build our faith, we build our church on the foundation of Jesus Christ as our cornerstone. We believe that Jesus came to offer us life in all its fullness now and for eternity. And so as we go from here tomorrow, we go as people of the gospel who are sent out, commissioned. We leave from the high point of the Eucharistic table nourished on bread and wine. We go out filled with the Spirit into our workplaces to meet with different people, some who will be full of joy and others who will be full of sorrow, and we go there as God's people, sent out from this place to live and to share the good news of Jesus Christ wherever our day takes us. Amen.